Today, we are looking at the philosophy of Peter Vessel Zapfa. This guy is not a particularly well-known philosopher, and if you happen to have heard of him or the schools of philosophy that he is associated with, it might be strange to you that we're looking at him in this class, which is supposed to be about ethics. But what I hope to reveal to you today is that what he has to say regarding his analysis of the human condition, our treatment of the environment, and the nature of suffering, is that it has direct implications for ethics, this field that we've been investigating the whole time in this class. Peter Vessel Zappa was a Norwegian philosopher. He was an accomplished mountaineer. And he was an environmentalist. He is one of the philosophers who pioneered the movement and school of thought known as deep ecology, which we're going to be touching on today. Pessimism characterizes his thought. Like some other thinkers in the history of philosophy, like Emil Chiorin or Arthur Schopenhauer, he's somebody who has a very sad, pessimistic outlook. And as we'll see, I think that this pessimistic outlook is informative about how far and how powerful ethics extends, which is one of the central questions that we've been trying to answer throughout our journey in this class. What we're going to be looking at today is his most famous essay, one of the only things of his that was actually translated into English, which is known as The Last Messiah. And this essay touches on topics like environmentalism, our treatment of the environment, and what characterizes our experience as humans in this vast and different cosmos. Before we start, I'd like to give you kind of a brief introduction to his school of thought and kind of what's motivating what he's going to be saying in this essay. Zapfa is a pessimist. Like Arthur Schopenhauer, largely he thinks that life is a mistake. For reasons that we will see, human life is not all sunshine and daisies. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. For him, the characteristic feature of human life is this particular orientation towards suffering. So I'm not expecting that this lecture is going to make anybody particularly joyful or happy, but I hope that it reveals to you some important things about what it means to live as a human and maybe what that should imply about our practices, our ethical practices going forward. He's known for contributing, like another thinker, Arne Nass, to deep ecology. Deep ecology, you might understand, is Leopold's environmentalist view on steroids. Deep ecology has a number of central tenets. One of them being humans exist within nature as just one participant or aspect of this larger interconnected system. Another central tenet is that the environment, the land, animals, all of these natural things have an intrinsic value and are worth protecting. A third tenet is that, unsurprisingly, we are not treating these things the way that we should. We are destroying the environment. We are eradicating species. Thus, because we are, in a sense, 
a cancer on the environment in which we live. Deep ecologists are going to argue that humans ought to be concerned with the impact that they're having on the world around them, so much so that we should drastically limit our population such that we don't continue destroying everything around us, polluting our lakes and rivers, and eradicating life. This thread, deep ecological thread, is something that we're going to see pop up again and again throughout the essay that we're looking at today. But the central thesis that Zappa is going to be providing for us is an analysis of the human condition. What does it mean to be a human in this, on this floating space rock in the middle of nowhere? What is the human experience like? How are we different from animals or the other life forms on this planet? Well, Zappa is going to be arguing that Humans live a kind of tortured, paradoxical existence. And by coming to terms with this, that has a few implications for the project of ethics as a whole and how we ought to live our lives individually and as a society moving forward. So, how exactly does Zappa characterize human life? Well, his focus is going to be on, like a lot of other philosophers, what separates us from the other animals? What separates us from the bugs, the reptiles, the birds, the other mammals? Here's what he has to say. Whatever happened, a breach in the very unity of life, a biological paradox, an abomination, an absurdity, an exaggeration of disastrous nature. Through the emergence of humans, life had overshot its target, blowing itself apart. A species had been armed too heavily by spirit made almighty without but equally a menace to its own well-being. Its weapon was like a sword without hilt or plate, a two-edged blade cleaving everything. But he who is to wield it must grasp the blade and turn the one edge toward himself. Despite his new eyes, man was still rooted in matter. His soul spun into it and subordinated to its blind laws. And yet he could see matter as a stranger compare himself to all phenomena, see through and locate his vital processes. He comes to nature as an unbidden guest, in vain extending his arms to beg conciliation with his maker. Nature answers no more. It performed a miracle with humans, but later did not know them. He has lost his right of residence in the universe, has eaten from the tree of knowledge, and has been expelled from paradise. He is mighty in the near world, but curses his might, has purchased with the harmony of his soul, his innocence, his inner peace in life's embrace. So there he stands with his visions, betrayed by the universe in wonder and fear. The beast knew fear well in thunderstorms and on the lion's claw. But man became fearful of life itself, indeed of his very being, life. That was for the beast to feel the play of power. It was heat and games and strife and hunger. And then at last to bow before the law, of course, death. In the beast, suffering is self-confined. In man, it knocks holes into a fear of, a, of the world and a despair of life. Even as the child sets out on the river of life, 
The roars from the waterfall of death rise highly above the veil, ever closer, and tearing, tearing at its joy. Man beholds the earth, and it is breathing like a great lung. Whenever it exhales, delightful life swarms from all its pores and reaches out toward the sun. But when it inhales, a moan of rupture passes through the multitude, and corpses whip the ground like bouts of hail. Not merely his own day could he see. The graveyards wrung themselves before his gaze. The laments of sunken millennia wailed against him from the ghastly decaying shapes. The earth turned dreams of mothers. Future's curtain unraveled itself to reveal a nightmare of endless repetition, a senseless squander of organic material. The suffering of human billions makes its entrance into him through the gateway of compassion. From all that happen arises a laughter to mock the demand for justice, his profoundest ordering principle. He sees himself emerge in his mother's womb. He holds up his hand in the air, and it has five branches. Whence this devilish number five, and what has it to do with my soul? He is no longer obvious to himself. He touches his body in utter horror. This is you, and so far do you extend, and no farther. He carries a meal within him. Yesterday it was a beast that could itself dash around. Now I suck it up and make it part of me. And where do I begin and end? All things chain together in causes and effects, and everything he wants to grasp dissolves before his testing thought. Soon he sees mechanics even in the so far whole and dear, in the smile of his beloved. There are other smiles as well a torn boot with toes. Eventually the features of things are features only of himself. Nothing exists without himself. Every line seems to point back at him. The world is but a ghostly echo of his voice. He leaps up loudly screaming and wants to disgorge himself onto the earth along with his impure meal. He feels the looming madness and wants to find death before losing even such ability. But as he stands before imminent death, he grasps its nature also, and the cosmic import of the step to come. His creative imagination constructs new fearful prospects behind the curtain of death, and he sees that even there is no sanctuary to be found. And now he can discern the outline of his biologic cosmic terms. He is the universe's helpless captive kept to fall into nameless possibilities. From this moment on, he is in a state of relentless panic. Such a feeling of cosmic panic is pivotal to every human mind. Indeed, the race appears destined to perish insofar as any effective preservation and continuation of life is ruled out when all of the individual's attention and energy goes to endure or relay the catastrophic high tension within. The tragedy of a species becoming unfit for life by over-evolving one ability is not confined to humankind. Thus it is thought, for instance, that certain deer in paleontological times succumbed as they acquired overly heavy horns. The mutations must be considered blind. They work, are thrown forth, without any contact of interest with their environment. In depressive states, the mind may be seen in the image of such an antler, in all its fantastic splendor, pinning its bearer to the ground. And thus, what Zappa describes for us is what it means to live with consciousness, a kind of mind, ability to reflect and introspect to consider all things. Think about the nature of your consciousness, about your conscious experience. What do you yearn for? You ask if there is a meaning or a purpose to your life. 
You seek solace and comfort. Answers and justifications. Why am I here? Is there a God? Is there a point to all of this suffering? Will I ever be able to find happiness? Oh, I wish I could be in a relationship with somebody that actually loved me. Is that possible? Is that ever going to happen? Will I be able to graduate from this program? Get my degree, find a job. Will I ever be happy? Or am I going to be stuck in this cycle of work? Endless drivel work for the rest of my life. What separates us from animals is that we have a consciousness. We have this thing that extends out beyond ourselves, that can question, that can interrogate, that can reflect. It reveals to us how much suffering there is in our lives. People cause us suffering, right? The other people in your life, think of the words that they say to you that cause you suffering, the actions that they commit. Think of all the times that your friends and family members have disappointed you. All of your hopes and dreams that have been dashed. Think of all the pain that you have experienced. Humans can meditate on these things. They can understand these things. They can reflect on the nature of their experience. But nature does not offer us any answers. We are stuck experiencing suffering in all of these different domains of human life. We seek answers and justifications for things, but nature does not respond with any answers or justifications. We are not told why we are here. We are not given an explanation, a satisfactory explanation of how we are supposed to live or what all this means. We suffer. We suffer a lot. And what is particularly worrisome and disturbing is that the shadow of suffering will never leave you. You will be haunted by it the rest of your life. You will never be able to prevent suffering. It is going to show up in all of its many forms and it will assault you. And so you will have to deal with anxiety and doubt and fear. And you're going to have to deal with people breaking your heart. Failure. Not living up to your own goals and dreams or the expectations of others. And you will feel a lot of physical pain. This is what characterizes human life. Consciousness, which opens us up to the reality and the potentiality of our own suffering. This is what separates us from animals. Animals aren't worried about getting a job, getting a degree, ruminating on all of their regrets and things that they wish they had done. The cow isn't worried about tomorrow. We, however, are endlessly worried and planning and anxious. This is what Zappa is trying to reveal to us. He says that with humans, nature had overshot its mark. We have consciousness. 
He likens it to a miracle. Other animals are not conscious to the extent that we are. Thus, though we have a natural physical body, flesh and blood, nails and hair and eyes, our consciousness, our overdeveloped consciousness, is not fit for our natural way of life. Animals, well, they're doing just fine. They seek after pleasure and reproduction, the prevention of suffering, but they don't worry about any of this stuff. They don't experience trauma like we do. They don't seek answers for their own existence, explanations, meaning. That is a curse that we have to bear. And it is a a curse that we cannot ultimately be rid of. That is what is particularly tragic about our lives. Though we have a mind or a consciousness which can consider all things, you can imagine anything. You can reflect on anything. You can wish and desire, will for whatever you want, Whatever, whatever you can think up. But in this domain of consciousness, our reach exceeds our grasp. We are never able to capture any guarantee that our life is going to be successful or happy. We are not able to divine why we are here, what all this means, if there's a reason or a purpose to our existence. We are stuck questioning. Nature does not provide us these answers. And so what does that do? Well, it produces a lot of anxiety within us. A lot of dread, despair, If you continue taking philosophy classes, you will be blessed, as I have, with countless existential crises. You laugh now, but when you're in them, they don't feel so good. What our consciousness makes us privy to is our own situation our own helpless situation, living in, living on a planet in this indifferent cosmos that doesn't care about us at all. That would go on without us. That doesn't try to protect us or make us happy. We are nature's helpless captive. And we are in part also other people's helpless captives as well. Think of how you are subject to your parents' will, your boss's whims, the administrators of the university, your professor, right, who could just assign you an F because he can. We do not have the answers, the justifications, or the power that we would like in order to make sure that our lives turn out okay. In some real way, we are confronted on all sides by this suffering, by this anxiety, this despair. Yet we cannot rest assured that justice will ever be established, that things are going to turn out okay. There's no guarantee you're ever going to meet the love of your life fall in love and have a family. You cannot rest easy in the assurance that your life will ultimately be happy or successful. Isn't that frightening? And what I think is perhaps worse than this 
is although you may not be experiencing suffering now, you must be aware that suffering is possible at every moment. And you will never be able to escape it. That is, unless you die. Then, if you believe there is no afterlife, let's say, yeah, you escape suffering. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The simple fact of the matter is, a lot of the questions that we have, issues that we have with life, problems, we're not able to answer or fix them. Throughout our lives, we're going to continue to experience suffering. Other people are going to hurt us. And we will probably hurt others. Perpetuating that suffering. We will experience physical pain. Things are not going to go as planned. We will experience heartache and disappointment. This is what it means to be human in some sense. We have been gifted, or Zappa might say cursed, with this capacity for reflection and understanding and thought and introspection. This consciousness reveals to us not only our own condition, but the conditions of others. The conditions of the environment, of animal life, of plant life. If it wasn't bad enough that you yourself are suffering and are living through some unendurable condition, think of all the suffering that we are causing other living things. Think of the friends and family members that you've hurt. Think of the wildlife that we are annihilating with our processes of mass agriculture and production and consumption. Think of all the natural habitats that we are destroying. And all for what? Is it worth it? Is it really adding that much value to our lives? Is it any salve for the suffering of human life? Zappa thinks that we have these existential and conscious needs that nature cannot satisfy. Again, we seek answers and justifications, explanations and reassurances. The cosmos are not going to offer that to you. Going out into nature will not provide you with the assurances and the answers and the justifications that you seek. You might ask those around you, hey, what do you think about all this? You think there's a meaning to life? Do we have free will? Is there a reason for all of this? What does anybody else know? <laughs> They're just as clueless as you are, as I am. We might say then that humans are trapped between blissful ignorance and those pieces of knowledge that would provide some security and happiness for us. Animals are blissfully ignorant. Animals are not constantly worried about their inevitable death, about the inevitable suffering that is going to assault them in human life, about the inevitable disappointment 
and pain that they're going to experience. Animals cannot conceive of those things. They don't worry about those things. They're not anxious. We are. We are not able to be as blissfully ignorant as animals. <clears throat> to exist in this oneness with nature, living always in the present moment in which we are not fixated on the past or the future. Instead, we are torn between the past and the future, between anxiety and suffering. We're not given the answers and the knowledge that we would like to have if we would like to alleviate some of this dread, some of this despair. And thus Zappa argues that what characterizes human life is the drive to not be human. In order to endure all of these paradoxes and these difficulties, this lack of answers and justifications, assurances and guarantees, what do humans do? How do we persist through all of this chaos and suffering? You all already know. You all already do it. We limit our consciousness. We try to become less human. Because it is by becoming less human that we can find some sort of comfort, some distraction, some respite from all of the suffering that confronts us. Zappa lists at least three strategies that humans engage in in order to try to alleviate their own suffering. All of these strategies involve us limiting our consciousness in various ways because giving it free reign is too much to bear. You know this. Think of those quiet moments that you have in your dorm room alone when nobody else is around. Or the brief minute that you have at a party where you go into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you wonder what it is all for. Why am I even here? One of the things that we do in order to alleviate this suffering is what Zappa calls anchoring. This is an excellent strategy for some people of enduring human existence. What is anchoring? Well, it basically involves somebody giving themselves an ideal or a purpose or a creed that they can tie themselves to. Something that subjectively gives their life meaning. That they can lose themselves in. So that they don't have to focus on all of the anxiety that constantly overwhelms them. This is what your religious zealot is doing. This is what somebody who is committed to a company and takes their job way too seriously is doing. This is somebody who perhaps is trying to become a moral saint. This strategy involves giving yourself some sort of creed or ideology or ideal, tying yourself to it, 
And in some sense, what that thing does for you is it holds you up. It allows you to go on living because it gives your it gives you something to focus your attention on rather than waiting aimlessly in all of this chaos. It might be a life's work, a project, a religion. It's something that allows you to focus your attention on anything other than your condition, than your existential condition. But perhaps this isn't the strategy that you all engage in. Maybe this next one is one that you'll find you engage in more. We can call it distraction. It involves barraging your consciousness with various impressions. In other words, you distract yourself from the suffering of your own life, from your own condition, from your own suffering and regrets and disappointments. This is what the drinker does. Or somebody who spends hours on their phone watching TikToks or scrolling through Instagram. If you smoke weed at night to relax, this is what you're doing. You preoccupy yourself with these various drug-induced states or alcohol-induced states or rushes of dopamine and serotonin that you get from watching digital media. It's a distraction. It allows you to forego thinking and ruminating on all of this suffering. On the fact that you're not all that you could be. That you're not living up to your parents' expectations. And so with various things, drugs, food, alcohol, television, Netflix, anime, movies, whatever it is, you distract yourself. Partly because boredom itself is just full of suffering. But also so that you do not think yourself to death. You do not overthink and overanalyze. The last one we'll discuss is what's known as sublimation. This strategy that humans use in order to try to cope with their life is different from the other ones. While the other ones involve you limiting your consciousness in certain ways, either by giving you something to focus on or distracting you with all of this stimuli, this strategy involves transforming your experience of suffering. It allows you to gain some distance from the trauma and terrible experiences that you have had. This is what the artist is doing. Zappa calls this strategy sublimation. It involves taking your traumatic experiences, your experiences that are full of suffering, your questions, your anxieties, and channeling them into some sort of activity or work of creativity. Producing a painting, or a piece of music, or a short story, which contains your experience, it contains your emotions. What this creative activity allows you to do is transform your emotional state 
and to engage with your suffering in a more detached way. Because by putting it in a piece of media, a painting, a drawing, you can then look at it and reflect on it in a way that is not so close to home. You gain some distance from it, from the terrible quality of that piece of suffering. Perhaps a prime example of this are artists like Vincent van Gogh, who take the experiences of their lives and they use them to create something, to transform their own emotional states or the outlooks of others on the nature of what it means to be human. And so Zappa argues, we humans engage in these different strategies in order to cope with our own existences. If you don't think you are suffering, you're lying to yourself. Think of how often you engage in these kinds of activities. How much time do you spend every day distracting yourself? Whether it's through drugs, alcohol, looking at your phone for hours on end. No, Zappa thinks that our lives are filled with suffering. So much so that we are driven to engage in these activities. These are defense mechanisms. Some people realize the truth of their situation, and they realize that these are only temporary solutions. So they kill themselves. Perhaps they are in some sense wiser than others. Not everybody can deal with the suffering of their life in this way. He says that humans are always longing for something and they are always longing away from their own unendurable condition. Our default state, in other words, is anxiety, despair, and suffering. Constantly we are trying to flee from it. That is why we chase things. That is why we run away from pain, from suffering. It is a reminder of what it characteristically means to be a human. So if you don't think you're suffering, you should reflect on that a little bit. Reflect on how much you are actually engaged in the activities that he is laying out here. And ask yourself, are you really truly happy in your life? How are things going for you? In our day and age, we use technology in order to escape from the mundaneness, the boredom, the anxiety, the guilt, the despair. We watch movies, we listen to podcasts or music. We watch the news. We watch our TikToks for hours on end or our Snapchat stories to take up the time, right? We browse the internet. We play video games. 
One could argue that the technology that we have now does an excellent job of distracting us. Perhaps more so than breads and circuses distracting those who have poor socioeconomic fates. We are caught up in our media, aren't we? Our screens, our laptops, our phones, all these different apps and trends. But this technology is no permanent solution to the issues that we face. Is this technology really alleviating the suffering on this planet? Or is it making it worse? Is it actually, actually helping you come to terms with your situation? Or is it just driving you further and further into denial and anxiety? Zappa thought that the technology that was around during his time, which isn't exactly the same that we have now, right? We've come a long way. It was preventing people from really reckoning with their situation and from truly spiritually living. Zappa saw interacting with nature as being one way that we could tap into what it fundamentally means to be human and derive some pleasure and some awe from those kinds of experiences. But how much time do we spend in nature now? He was an avid mountaineer, an excellent mountain climber in his own right. How much time do you spend in the forests, near the rivers, climbing the mountains, or on the plains, or in the meadows? Have you walled yourself up within these artificial constructs? What kind of toll is that taking on your life? or on natural life, more generally. While we have a lot of distractions nowadays, ultimately, these distractions are preventing us from understanding and reckoning with our situation. Watch all the TikToks, Facebook videos you like, it's never going to get rid of your suffering and your anxiety, your depression. Play sports, lift, hang out with your family, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. None of those things are going to eliminate the mental illnesses you have. The suffering that you experience, the disappointment, the lack of certainty and guarantee that you long for, that you so long for. We would have to get rid of human consciousness in order to rid ourselves of suffering and the potential for suffering. Thus, what Zappa offers us here is a pessimistic philosophy which has implications not only for our human lives generally, but also for the topics of this class. Ethics, living a good life, trying to be a good person. In Susan Wolfe's essay, she argued that Trying to be a moral saint is not going to be a fulfilling life for you, right? It's not going to allow you to become a well-rounded person with diverse interests and experiences. 
In that way, you could say that she's arguing prioritizing being a moral person above everything else is not the path to a fulfilled life. We might say something similar when it comes to Zappa's philosophy. Although we care about being good people, about being kind and loving and patient and honest and generous, chasing after morality, trying to be the best moral person that we can be, is never going to eliminate the suffering that you or others experience. Why? You're never going to be able to eliminate racism, sexism, inequality. You're never going to be able to eliminate suffering from human life generally. Why? Well, because what it means to be conscious, in some sense, is to suffer. To exist as a human being is to suffer. And perpetuating human existence is also going to perpetuate suffering. Suffering of the environment insofar as we pollute and destroy it. Suffering of animal life insofar as we engage in factory farming. Locking these animals up in tiny cages, giving them growth hormones so that they can't even stand on their own two feet for very long. Killing them, consuming them. And so at the end of this essay, Zappa leaves us with a startling conclusion. If you follow his chain of logic to the end, it implies something very disturbing about the power of ethics for human life, but also the path that we should perhaps take that lies before us as individuals and as a species. Here is how he ends the essay. If we continue these considerations to the bitter end, then the conclusion is not in doubt. As long as humankind recklessly proceeds in the fateful delusion of being biologically fated for triumph, nothing essential will change. As its numbers mount and the spiritual atmosphere thickens, the techniques of protection must assume an increasingly brutal character. And humans will persist in dreaming of salvation and affirmation and a new Messiah. Yet when many saviors have been nailed to trees and stoned on the city squares, then the last Messiah will come. Then will appear the man who, as the first of all, has dared strip his soul naked and submit it alive to the outmost thought of the lineage the very idea of doom. A man who has fathomed life and its cosmic ground and whose pain is the earth's collective pain. With what furious screams shall not mobs of all nations cry out for his thousandfold death when like a cloth his voice encloses the globe and the strange message has resounded for the first and last time. The life of the world's is a roaring river, but Earth's is a pond and a backwater. The sign of doom is written on your brows. How long will ye kick against the pinpricks? But there is one conquest and one crown, one redemption and one solution. Know yourselves. Be infertile and let the Earth be silent after ye. And when he has spoken, they will pour themselves over him, 
led by the pacifier makers and the midwives, and bury him in their fingernails. He is the last Messiah. As son from father, he stems from the archer by the water hole. And so what is the conclusion? What is the solution to human suffering? What should we do if we want to protect nature? If we want to allow animal life to go on living? If we want to make sure that no human ever suffers again? We let ourselves die out. We stop having children. As long as we keep having children, we are only going to bring people into this world who are going to experience great suffering and who are going to perpetuate suffering, who are going to hurt others, who are going to lie and kill and steal, who are going to destroy the environment, eradicate animal species, and leave the earth a barren wasteland. Being a good person is not going to save us from the suffering of human life. Zappa argues that if we take the problem of suffering seriously, we should stop reproducing. If we really care about the environment, about animals, about preventing suffering, the only way to do that is to make it so that no human is ever born again. This is his pessimistic conclusion. And this is the path that he thinks we should take. So what do you think? Do you agree with him? Yeah, I, I don't think he would probably characterize his own thought as being particularly sad. But, you know, from any normal vantage point, it looks like a pessimistic view. You know, suffering is going to continue to propagate unless we just die out. Seems kind of sad, doesn't it? No, um, I think it seems like perfectly logical. <laughs> So you agree? Um, I do. You think we should let ourselves die out? Yeah. Like, personally, I know I could never have kids. Like, I just couldn't do it. Um, it just seems like, it just seems suffering is inevitable. I don't think that the point of life is to suffer, but I feel like people are going to suffer regardless. So I just don't think I could, like, bring people into this world knowing that they're going to suffer. That seems like, I don't know. What about all the happiness that they could experience? Have you been in love? Isn't that incredible? Yeah, but I'm not in love anymore. <laughs> I see, okay. Yeah. That's fair. So, bringing a life into existence wouldn't be worth it, you don't think? For the person, maybe. Yeah. Like other people can, but nonetheless. It seems incredibly selfish. Okay. I think Zappa might agree. And I think he would say unless we change something radically about how we conceive of nature and how we are acting, bringing humans into existence is going to end up making things worse not only for the environment, but also for future generations. There is an aspect of this deep ecological view which is very concerned with overpopulation. So, I mean, I got a lot of things going through my head right now. <laughs> I don't agree. Um, 
I, I think there was one, like just the idea that we're all suffering in general is like, that in itself is pessimistic. And I think this is <laughs> you may be based off that. Yeah, um, yep. Like, I just wrote myself a little note that was like, okay, like it's suggesting that as humans over time we become less of ourselves essentially. But what if we were born in a world with just a very wide lens of how we perceive things and over time we're narrowing that and becoming more of ourselves. So you could look at this two different ways and I think that looking at it in a pessimistic view and just like always having that kind of belief, whenever something's going wrong in your life, you're gonna turn to that and you're gonna start just assuming that you're suffering. You're not gonna think you can get through anything. Sure. You're not gonna wanna keep living on. And the fact of the matter is like, the world's gonna keep going no matter how you feel. And people are going to have to compete with each other to find happiness or find some sort of value in their life. So but believing in something like this is just like you're just taking me out. Like you just you're giving up. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people would agree. Um, it is a rather dreary outlook, right? You might say it's defeatist. You might say if, if you believe in this, it would cause you more suffering than if you didn't believe in it. You know? And who's to say that your life is actually as terrible as he makes it seem? Zappa thinks that we are all suffering deeply, and that is why we're trying to hide it by distracting ourselves, by following a religion or a political ideology. But if we're weighing human suffering against everything else, look at all the amazing things that we have going for us in life. And the things that humans have created. Classical music, works of art, myths, poetry, your favorite musical artist, right? That's some pretty awesome stuff. Maybe it's not true that this isn't all worth it. Maybe there is positive value to human existence. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like, we get into that, like, it's all just part of the experience of life. And, you know, it's, it's ultimately how happy you are is going to depend on how you perceive that mm. while you're here. So, I mean, like, I think this type, this belief, whatever you choose to believe in, whether you think you're just living in existential dread or you think there's some things you can accomplish in life, I think that's going to separate people that ultimately live happy, happy lives from people that don't. And, mm. you know, I'm not going to be on the side of pessimism and just, you know, always... Because, like, that's going to become a social projection that I put on other people, mm. right? When I communicate with people and I'm just depressed and sad all the time, like, what's that going to do to them? That's going to suggest to them that that's how people are. People, like, maybe they should be that way a little bit more. Sure. And it's like playing a game of infection. And the more mm. sad people you have, going out projecting those feelings on other people, yeah, we're going to live in an existential dread. Like, no one's going to be happy. But if more people took it upon themselves to be stronger individuals and like, pick themselves up, pick other people up, then, there, I, there, then there's no suffering. So you would, you would say we have more control over our suffering than he leads on? Yeah. You have a choice to learn from it or not. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I just feel like this is so wild. It's like everything you would do is like, he's saying is a distraction, basically. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. Because I'm like, what, like if you sleep, like that's a distraction. Like, God forbid I go to bed at night. <laughs> like, that's oh like, yeah, there's some things we can't avoid doing, you know, like. That's the way I feel about this. I just, I'm not a big fan of this. I agree with what he said. Like, the way that you present yourself is ultimately how you're gonna see your suffering. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're suffering or not. Sometimes you are, and if you continue to just like wallow in that, you're not gonna get any better. And I feel 
feel like that's maybe why you guys have a point of view. He's <laughs> suffering and he's just not doing anything to get out of it. I feel like that's just almost like a, like, I don't want to say lazy, but I'm like, at some point. There's something wrong with it. Like, yeah, I'm like, you can, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with suffering. Like, I, I really don't. I just think there gets to a point where, like, if you're just constantly going to be down and out about it, like, okay, maybe it's time to, like, to think a different way. Try to reframe your mindset just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, see, so you, you don't want to accept this pessimistic outlook. And it, do you agree with his conclusions? Should we let ourselves die out? I don't, I don't agree with that. <laughs> we should go on living and creating things and doing cool stuff. Maybe. Yeah? Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Well, going back to what um, you said about, like, kind of just seeing the different viewpoints of how, like, you can dial on life. Um, I mean, yeah, it's like you have pros and cons, you have ups and downs in life, but. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you do have a say in how you handle it and whatnot. Um, mm. But at the same time, let's not look at it as if the universe is like surrounds us. We are mm. all on this earth together, uh, and look how much is happening in the world, both good and bad. Um, but in recent times, a lot of bad. Well, it's also something that is propagated, popularized a lot more. Because it's easy. Um, sure. But what about that? Like, wouldn't it be easier to just stop? Like, I agree with him. I, <laughs> I had, I've had, uh, um, I wouldn't say thoughts because that's always looked at in a negative, negative light. But I've had thoughts of like, or ideas of what this would actually be like. I feel like I'm adding myself. Um, just like, you know, it all stems from like, not people like us. And by people like us, I just mean like, I'm assuming we're all probably, you know, we're just college students, you know? I'm talking about people that are like above us, both uh, in status and in economics and authority sure. and stuff like that. Like, I feel like we could all, in this last classroom at least, can differentiate between what we want as being positive or negative, but it's whenever people above us that have a little bit more control that uh, I wouldn't say want to have more sway, but... Well, they have more ability to yeah. influence, you know, how... Yeah. yeah. It's the people that influence that I feel like should probably go away. Okay. But, like, me personally, like... I still, I, I would still like have kids. I know somebody mentioned that they couldn't, which is obviously fine. Um, but like, I would want kids. I would want to start a family. I would, I mean, I'm gonna be a teacher one day. I want to teach the next generation and then some. But like, I wouldn't disagree with this outcome either because there is a lot of suffering. There is a lot of this, that, and the other. I mean. Maybe we could logically agree. I mean, we could say he's right in so far as, yeah, if all humans died out, human suffering would be eliminated. But is that a desirable outcome? <laughs> you know, is that what we want? Um, I don't. You know, you you could think. Look, even if people's lives are filled with suffering, there is some sort of intrinsic value to life. You could believe that. My or more optimistic moments, I kind of believe that. And I think that humans have done a lot of really cool things, produced a lot of awesome things. I kind of want to see where that goes. You know, maybe in the near future we'll have like lightsabers. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, would I rather have lightsabers or maintain the environment? I'm going to choose the environment, but lightsabers are still pretty cool. Yeah. I 
Yeah. Some people can't. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm glad he's born. I like your life. But I guess I'm just wondering if he believes in happiness at all. I, I think he thinks that people, yeah, they can find moments of happiness. Yeah. What he's primarily concerned with, I think, is, well, the environment and how he, we should change our relationship to it, he thinks. But just following this train of thought to its logical conclusion. This position that we shouldn't have kids is known as antinatalism. And this is what Zappa encourages insofar as having children is going to keep human suffering alive, it's a bad thing. But you don't have to agree with him that we shouldn't have kids. You don't have to agree with him that human life is inherently suffering in some sense. Maybe you believe it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of how you interpret things. In any case, the reason why we're looking at him in this class is not only because his thought has certain implications for environmental policy and action, but also because it reveals an aspect of ethics that Wolf was also touching on, which is this. It's all great that you're taking an ethics class, that you're trying to learn you know, what's right and what's wrong and how to be a better person. But being a good person itself is not going to carry you through life and leave you completely satisfied and fulfilled. In some sense, you need to develop a wider, more comprehensive philosophy of life. Being a good person is a good thing, but I don't think many, if any, people in this room would be able to be ultimately fulfilled from just trying to become a moral saint. And I think Zappa's philosophy implies that. Does anybody have any final comments, questions, concerns about this? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, I, I actually do have one thing to say. Go for it. Yeah. I've actually heard that argument Yeah, you, you don't agree with that? Yeah. I insofar as I I want to have kids, I don't think I agree with it either. I, I recognize the uh, the consequences, right, of having children. I think the parents should do that, but yeah, I, I'm not in complete agreement with Zappa, I don't think. <laughs>